the record button. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, so today we're we're going to come back to um, abuse and violence um, uh, domestic because uh, it's important. And it it struck me today as I was as I was doing some research this morning. Um, there's very few couples that I work with where there's actual domestic violence going on, meaning like there's physical harm, uh, threat, punishment actually happening. But um, there's a whole culture around domestic violence and there are a lot of little actions that reinforce uh, domestic violence. Uh, where, where I'm getting a lot of my data from, it's called the power and control wheel. And you can just, you can just Google that power and control wheel PDF. Um, and it comes from the, I think the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence or something like that. And um, there are, I think, eight different areas uh, where it, it talks about relational violence. And so, so in, a, in a domestically violent relationship, all of these eight little areas are uh, to reinforce the fear and the threat um, they are to reinforce the abuse. So in a lot of uh, domestically violent relationships, hands-on stuff actually doesn't happen very often, um, but it, it doesn't need to happen very often um, because the threat of that is reinforced through all these different areas. So while a lot of the folks that I work with, uh, they don't deal with the hands-on things, so many other parts of this violent culture are part of their relationship. Um, so I think it's important to bring to your attention, and I think it's important for you to think about whether you are... Um, an addict in recovery or you're a partner um, or you're in a workplace that doesn't feel great to be in. Um, a lot of times our, our, our perception of what is okay or what's you know uh, abusive or unhealthy, we take it to an extreme while well, I'm not being hit um, or you know my uh, you know my, my, my boss doesn't make me do humiliating things or whatever it is but um, just like in so many other parts of recovery, um, we, we learn not to ride the edge. Um, you know, so uh, uh, Scott and the, the Seeking Integrity people put out a, a blog post a while ago um, about not porn um, and, you know, what a fallacy that is to try to split hairs. And so, so over the next few of these sessions, I want to introduce you to that culture of domestic violence, um, because if you are living in any parts of this culture, I think it's really important you ask why. Even if you're not laying a hand on your spouse, um, what, what does it mean about you and what does it mean about your relationship if it has every other marker of domestic violence except for hitting? Um, it, it's not a, I wouldn't say it's a badge to be worn. Well, we never get physical. It's something to be concerned about. Uh, what's going on inside of me that I'll tolerate this? What's going on inside of me um, that I'm okay doing this to my partner. So, um, because re recovery is so much about, it, it's not about what we're not doing. Um, I think that's about white knuckling, um, uh, getting sober. Um, recovery is about uh, taking a clearly delineated stance on your principles or your values, and then living in accordance with that. It's not just stopping what's, uh, what's bad or, or what somebody else doesn't like. It's creating something that is wonderful and creating something that's great that you're gonna be a part of. So uh, if uh, Scott's put in the chat uh, a link to the uh, power and control PDF. So if you wanna follow along, I bet you can. We're gonna talk about emotional abuse and intimidation. Um, do you want me to do a, a quick screen share? Oh, sure. Okay, I yeah. can do that. Um, we'll talk about emotional abuse and intimidation today. And again, keep in mind, um, that uh, by themselves, uh, by definition, this does not make a, a domestic violence relationship, but these are the parts of the, the relationship culture that reinforce the fear, the control, um, the intimidation. So when it comes to int intimidation, uh, this is defined by um, making another afraid by using looks, actions, or gestures. Uh, smashing things, destroying property, um, abusing pets, disp uh, displaying weapons. Um, intimidation, I can see also 
uh, you know, between men and women, there are, are different ways that they do it. Um, uh, I think uh, traditionally, uh, men tend to be a bit bigger than women. We have more muscle mass. Uh, we're built differently. And um, whether you're aware of it or not, you can use that mass and that presence to send a message. Um, I'll, I'll go on the assumption that if this is something that you're doing in your relationship, you don't have awareness of it. Because I would hope if you did have awareness, you would stop. Um, because if, if, if your intent is not to physically harm another person, why would you use your, your presence, uh, your mass, uh, your anger to intimidate another person? Um, again, that's about control. That's about power. Um, that's about making another person feel small and afraid. Um, and that's definitely not in line with any recovery rubric that I'm aware of. Um, that's not in line with any kind of mental health uh, definition that I'm aware of. Um, emotional abuse uh, in, in some similar ways is about putting another person down, um, making them feel bad about themselves, calling them names, uh, making another feel like they are crazy. Mind games, humiliating another person, uh, making another person feel guilty. Um, as I went through the criteria for emotional abuse or the, the markers of emotional abuse here, I thought a lot about um, gaslighting and crazy making um, that can happen in addictive relationships. Um, generally, when I, when I talk with couples about their relationships and what makes uh, things work, I, I try to keep it uh, light and uh, focused on capacities. I try not to get too doom and gloom because there's so much about relationships that are, are good and um, you know feel great and are beneficial to both parties. Um, but this is something that I think needs a really stern, honest uh, conversation. Um, because there's no shades here when it comes to intimidation or emotional abuse. There's not light intimidation or light emotional abuse. Um, and again, if if your purpose is to if, if your purpose in your relationship is not about controlling or making another person afraid, I don't know why you would do these things. Um, so um, this is this is a justification I'll hear a lot and. Um, Unfortunately, I have to work with this a lot with couples. When I see this kind of stuff happening, I have to call it what it is. Did you know this is part of a culture of abuse? Um, and usually I hear some kind of justification, surprisingly from both, um, because it's not just the person who's in power that may not be motivated to look at this. It can be really disempowering and it can feel really bad for the person who's on the receiving end of abuse to admit I'm being taken advantage of, um, I'm being abused. And um, my, my question then is, if this is an abuse and it's not about power and control, then what are you trying to accomplish by doing any of this? And is it working? Um, it's so easy in our relationships to got, get caught in patterns, thinking that if I raise my voice or if I'm sharp or if I'm critical with my spouse, this time they'll get the message. And before you know it, 25 years have gone by and no message has been received and nothing's better. Um, and so the reason why you're doing it uh, isn't really about trying to get the job done then. Because if you wanted to get the job done, you would pull back and you'd find something effective to do in getting the job done. If you need your partner to pay attention to you, there's positive ways uh, to get your partner's attention. Um, if you need your partner to take a concern of yours seriously, there are helpful ways uh, to do that. Um, we don't have to use fear, threat, intimidation, um, anything like that. Um, I would say, and th this is this is a hard thing, I think, for individuals to look at because in a relationship, uh, we often we often spend so much energy trying to justify our actions rather than looking at why we're taking them. So I would say if you're participating or you're perpetuating any of these abusive culture uh, aspects of your relationship, it's really about you being angry. Um, and not giving an F what happens as a result of you being angry. It's really about you throwing in the towel. You're abdicating your responsibility as a partner and as an adult. Um, and you're doing whatever the hell you feel like doing um, because you're angry. Again, there's a really close parallel, I think, to living in active addiction, um, which is I'll do what I want to do and I'll do what makes it easier for me rather than really dealing with things. Um, and, and I'll point out here too, uh, this isn't just a problem that I see my addicted individuals have. 
Um, again, there's good reasons why a spouse would be angry and hurt. Um, but justice is not doing to another person what they did to you so they know what it feels like. Um, restoration is not treating another person awfully because they treated you awfully. Um, justice and reparation comes from um, holding high principles and high ideals and keeping the bar at where we want the society to function, not keeping the bar at where people don't know if John froze or I did. If it's John that froze, can somebody pop that in the chat feature for me? And if nobody pops anything into the chat, I'll know it's me. John is frozen. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, hopefully he'll come back here in a second because um, this is a great topic. Um, does anybody, if you have any questions about this or anything else, pop them in the chat feature and we'll get to them while we wait for John to come back. Um, I am going to text him there. Ah, okay, he's come. He's going to log back in. <laughs> It'll be just a second. Um, thank you for letting me know that it wasn't me. Um, so sorry for the delay. Um, um, yeah, I'm sort of fascinated by this topic. Um, I've written down a bunch of questions, but make sure you type your questions in. There's John. He's back. Um, I'm not sure what happened there, but that was, I, I was, I was pretty much done with the thought. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to save this question for a minute, but, um, so abuse, it, it takes two to participate in abuse. Does it not? It takes one to dish it out and one to receive it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I, I see this all of the time and it's, it's hard because, um, while there is a clear dish or outer and there is a clear taker, I think when, when there's an abuse in a relationship, it, it's not just a one person's responsibility to stop that. Um, and it's the hardest thing in the world, both to check your own behavior that you've been engaged with unconsciously. And that makes you realize like, I'm not as great as I thought I was. Um, and to stand up to someone who terrifies you and say, you don't get to treat me that way. That's not going to fly here. Yeah, um, and, and I, I bring this up because somebody um, popped in the chat feature. Um, for years, I did not even know that I was abused and dominated. Yeah. Do you see that a lot where we just think this is how relationships are? Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I go back to our very first concept of what love is and it's not, there's not a universal definition um, of, of what love is. Um, I think there's definitions that are more true to what the nature of love is, but usually our, our first impression of love is whatever we got from our parents, um, because love is part of what we needed um, as kids. It's part of what we need to feel safe and secure and to be able to grow and thrive. And um, so I think there's a lot of distortion, I guess. We, we take what our first experience is and say, this must be what relationships are. Um, or, you know, we can be really afraid of being alone or losing someone that really does have some good qualities and there are things that we love. And so we, we kind of eat around, uh, so to speak, we eat around the rotten parts um, and say it doesn't really matter. Um, again, I, I think a big part of recovery is setting the bar high for yourself and your relationships. And that's not the same as being nitpicky and um, unreasonable. If you're gonna put the kind of effort that uh, real recovery takes into your life, why wouldn't you set the bar really high? Um, why wouldn't you, you know, shoot for the absolute best, not just, oh, I guess this is what I'm getting. Yeah, and I, I'm, both parties will, you, yeah, and you mentioned this, both parties will find a way to justify this behavior. Yeah. And it, it really, so how does somebody who, doesn't even really realize that they're they're getting abused. How do they come to that realization normally? And then what is their reaction normally? You know, I'll see kind of a, a typical arc, um, and and I'll, I'll I'll 
I'll talk about this through the Google searches that these people will probably do. It'll probably start with how can I be a better partner? Um, and, you know, they'll, they'll try to, you know, I, I make their favorite food. I, you know, keep them unstressed. I, you know, talk about whatever they want to talk about. Um, and then as time goes on and you're seeing that that's not working, um, the Google search might say like, why am I so unhappy in my marriage? Um, what does it mean when my spouse uh, yells at me or controls money? Or uh, is it okay for my spouse to punch holes in the wall? And then they'll come across this idea of abuse and domestic violence. And they'll say, oh my gosh, that sounds a lot like me. And then there, the Google searches will read, am I really being abused you know, for a really long time? And then there will be this dawning recognition, okay, this is what this is. And it's hard because, um, I don't know, there's the, the pop psychology wisdom says, you know, there's certain deal breakers in relationships everybody has to have. And, you know, if you're sticking around uh, for this, you're crazy. It's always more complicated than that. Um, so I think that recognition comes over time as you realize it doesn't matter what you do. Um, it may not be about you being a bad partner. It may be about your partner um, needing to be in a position of control over you. Um, maybe about your partner's unbounded, unchecked rage and anger. And just to be clear, not every relationship has like every aspect of it on equal footing. Sometimes one person is the person who makes the decision about this or vice versa. And that's okay as long as it's mutually agreed upon and, and everybody's okay with it. As We're long talking as about it... when somebody's taking all the power. Yeah, as long as it's an overt agreement, there are some relationships where, where one person does hold all of the power and it can work great if that's actually what both people have agreed to. We actually sat down, we hashed it out, we talked about it, we know why this is a good idea for us and we know what our, we know what our expectations and roles are within that. Um, and any relationship constellation, it only works if it's uh, explicit if you've actually talked about it, not just we stumbled our way into this and I guess this is what we're going to do. Well, and I, I, I hate to bring up religion, but I'm, I'm going to do it and feel free to ignore this question. But when a religion is saying, you know, the woman is the property of the man or, or whatever, um, or when a, a culture believes that, a certain culture believes that, um, how, how, do, how do people deal with that, um, particularly when, the person who's being put down starts to see it and rebel against it. I mean, how does that extra dimension play in? I, I have yet, um, and, I, and I, actually just, I actually just listened to a book that was like the entire uh, history of scripture across all religions uh, for all time. And um, I, I could be wrong, and I'm sure there's an exception to this, but I have yet to... Um, see in the total writings of any major religion, anything that condones that. In fact, um, you take Islam, for example, and there is a lot of like the man is the head of the household and things like that. There's also a ton of writings in there that say, so your responsibility is to care for the people who are under you. They must be safe. Like uh, you're, you know, it, it's a crime to mistreat the people that you have stewardship over. Christianity reads the same way. And the, the problem in those systems where the abuse is condoned and it's blamed on the religion or it's held up by the religion is it's actually not a complete understanding of the idea. Um, you know, we talk about rights all the time and very seldomly do we turn around to responsibilities. Um, if you believe that it's your right to take the lead in your relationship, what are your responsibilities then? Because you do have those. And, and your rights are only supported uh, by you taking responsibility uh, for what comes along with that. So, I mean, this part, one of the reasons why this is so hard to deal with is because it does get very sticky very quick. Um, and, you know, so, so my, my plea here is not so much if you recognize this is going on, confront your spouse about it. Um, that might be dangerous. Um, uh, but I, 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 my plea here is if this is going on, whether you're dishing it out or whether you're on, more on the receiving end, um, start thinking about this. Start talking with safe people about it because um, it's, it's a very damaging place for both of you to stay in. Thank you, thank you for addressing that and making that 
and really, I think an important clarification, you know, we talk about rights, we, we almost never talk about responsibilities. Right. And yeah, um, like, they are one as in the a same. parent, I probably have a right to, you know, tell my kid what's what sometimes. But I also have a responsibility to nurture my kid and help my kid learn how to make decisions for himself or her. So, you know, uh, there's there's more that, there's more to it. So, yeah. You know. um, okay, let's jump into the questions. Type questions into the Q and A, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, my sex addict husband is very uh, angry with me. Um, our marriage therapist told us that he is angry with the wrong woman. Uh, is this typical for enmeshed men? And does it ever end? Um, if so, how long will it take and what will he need to do? This is <laughs> right up your alley as uh, one of the enmeshment experts in our nation. Yeah, yeah, um, 100% typical with enmeshed men. Um, and uh, the, the, the path out of this is two-pronged. How long it takes, uh, I mean, it could be resolved in a day. It could take years. It all depends on... Um, I'd say primarily what he's willing to do and what the two of you are willing to do. So first, what he's willing to do. Um, I've never seen an Amesh man get better and fully heal who is not willing to own his anger. Um, you know, 100% of the guys that I work with with enmeshment issues, when they talk about anger, they're usually preface it with, this is going to sound so awful, but... And usually I'll say to him, would you stop prefacing that? Just say what is awful. Say what you're angry about. We can deal with that. Um, you don't need to protect your mother. Um, so, so for him, it's first being coming, be, be, being able to become willing to own his anger. A lot of these enmeshed guys, uh, the relationship with their mother didn't allow for anger. You can't be mad at me. I'm your mother. I do everything for you. Uh, there can be guilt. Mom can break down into a puddle when a kid is angry. It's so natural for kids to get angry at, at their parents. My four-month-old gets mad at me. Um, I can see it over her whole body. She clenches up and she gets stiff and she growls. Um, and that's so normal. Um, so a, a lot of enmeshed guys uh, feel guilty or they feel wrong or they feel like they're going to break something if they're angry. And they have to come to terms with that. And they have to own the fact that they get angry um, and that there can be good reasons for them to be angry. The second part of that is what the two of you are willing to face together. Um, I would say if you're in a close relationship and you don't have things that you're angry about, you're not in that relationship. Um, so for the two of you, um, once he has sorted out his right to be angry and has, has appropriately gotten angry with mother and put the anger where it belongs, it could be mother, it can be job, it could be all sorts of places. Once he delineates where that anger is actually supposed to go, then you, have to do, you two have to deal with how you're angry with each other. And what's not working. The problem, if you skip step one and try to go to step two, is um, where you give the anger voice, all of it's going to go. So if you don't have permission to be angry across all areas of your life where you might be angry, your spouse will get it all. Um, that's not to say once you give yourself permission to be angry everywhere in your life, you're going to find out you're really not angry with your spouse. You could still be angry with your spouse. And that's important to know if that exists in the relationship because it means you two have some things to work out. Um, you have a relationship to construct that would be better for the two of you. Um, but the first stop is um, working on the guilt and ambivalence around feeling angry in the first place. Um, I'll always say to the mesh guys I work with, um, and, until you accept that you're angry or until you accept that there's a boundary violation, um, your spouse is going to be one who pays the price emotionally because that's who you'll take it out on. Um, so it's 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 a two prong approach, but first things first. So, quick question, um, kind of a follow up here: enmeshed mothers, are they always enmeshed? Do they never change? Uh, no, actually, uh, one of my favorite stories. It was, it was the sweetest, funniest. Um, maybe oddest thing I ever saw in an enmeshment workshop, uh, the, the group was checking in and getting to know each other. And um, one guy said, you know, we, we have the guys not communicate with the outside world or use their phones uh, for the weekend. And, and one guy said something like, oh, I'll be able to do that. My last conversation before I got here was actually with my mom. And I told her I was gonna do this workshop and that I wanted to work on not being as enmeshed with her. And she said she thought that would be okay. Um, 
And uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, in some of the follow up, this guy and his mother had more conversations about that. And she said, yeah, I recognize that wasn't uh, fair for me. We, we've had mothers call in and say, I'm worried I'm doing this to my children. Can you help? Um, so not, not every enmeshing parent is oblivious. Um, I think more are than are not. Um, but there are some out there, once you show them the way and you put a name on it, they, they have recognition and they, they go with it. Yeah. Yeah. Mine is, mine is clueless. Yeah. <laughs> just, just for the record, she's clueless. Yeah. I'm your mother. Would you treat your friends this way? No. Well, why do you treat this, me this way? Cause I'm your mother. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. <laughs> Sorry, this is not about me. Um, my sex addict partner's parents were neglectful and also engaged in shaming under the guise of humor. Um, how does a neglect scenario give rise to enmeshment and also the shaming? You might want to throw that in there while you're at it, John. Um, or is it growing up with a narcissistic parent that would account for his enmeshment um, and his, en his denial of this enmeshment? And this comes from a different person. So we're getting some en yeah. enmeshment questions today. Yeah, you know, it's there's so much to delineate out and and Dr. Adams and I and the rest of the overcoming measurement team, we have a lot of work to do in, in actually delineating this out. I think uh, there's a lot of people who identify with the enmeshment narrative because that idea that my mother and my family looms large in my mind, um, a lot of people resonate with that. Um, however, I don't think that every time that happens, the, the mechanism is enmeshment. Um, in, enmeshment, I would say, comes from a um, needy parent who parentifies the child. Sometimes that needy parent is also cruel and, um, you know, can draw you in and then, you know, punch you on the back end, um, so to speak. Uh, or, you know, there can be overt uh, sexual abuse or covert uh, sexual abuse. Um, with a narcissistic parent, it can be a little bit different. So uh, this has to do with a narcissistic personality structure. Um, th there's, a, there's a spectrum and there's a, a couple different ends. There's the kind of narcissist who thinks they're the God of the universe. And then there's a kind of narcissist who thinks that um, they are not the God of the universe, but ought to be. And uh, so they wanna put themselves as close to greatness as possible. Um, both will do a lot of damage to their kids. Um, the God of the universe narcissist will be in competition with their children. And um, when, when their children don't perform, a narcissist doesn't have differentiation. In, in, in other words, um, the line is blurred between themselves and the outside world. And, and that's why we say with a narcissist, it's all about you. It, it's because if, you know, I, I use the example with a client the other day, um, if I was a narcissist, uh, this lamp that I have in my room would be the best lamp in the world. I wouldn't put anything around me that's not the best thing. Even if the lamp is a piece of crap and it's ugly as can be and it flickers, if I have it, it must be great because I must be great. Um, so the way that gets projected onto a kid with the narcissist who has to be the god of the universe is, uh, like I said, there's competition and um, the kid has to be great or <clears throat> they don't exist. There can be a lot of coldness that can create this yearning, this longing, this like, I always want to please you uh, kind of thing with the kid. Um, I wouldn't say that it's a true enmeshment dynamic unless the parent is explicit about their need. So they may be God of the universe 90% of the time, but 10% of the time their little infant needs to be taken care of. That's where the enmeshment comes in. But the kid who's always lobbying for a parent's approval who will not give it, not quite the same as enmeshment. What I see with those men is there's much more of a rage and anger dynamic and extreme self-doubt, but there's not the guilt about pulling away. A lot of those men will have, great, yeah, I would love to leave you alone, uh, get out of my life. Um, for an enmeshed guy, there's gonna be more ambivalence around that. On the other side, where the parent may be more insecure, they can puff their child up. Um, you are the God of the universe, I won't be, but I have the greatest kids. Um, and so that's where I'll see a lot more than enmeshment dynamic come because the parent's insecurity is more overt. Um, the parent's insecurity is more like, you know, mom will even tell you, uh, I just, what, what kind of mother are they going to think I am if you don't get straight A's? Um, so 
it's not to say there is a lot of narcissistic parents with enmeshed men that I see, but a narcissistic parent does not necessarily make for an enmeshed man. Thank you. And there, there's hundreds of different kinds of neglect too. There's emotional neglect and all that stuff. And I, and I do think um, narcissistic parents and enmeshed parents tend to do a lot of emotional abuse, which you just talked about earlier. Yes. A lot of control through emotional abuse. Um, the messages I got growing up were, you're better than everyone else, but you're not good enough and never will be. Yeah. And you can do anything you want as long as I do it for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah, you'll never that, get it quite right. <laughs> see that as long as I do it for you, there's the enmeshing dynamic. The parent needs the child um, with, with a more overt, um, you could call it a malignant narcissist. The parent doesn't need the child and the child knows that. Yeah, so, okay, um, next one here. Um, being in recovery from narcissistic abuse, um, codependence, betrayal, trauma, PTSD, et cetera, um, I am now learning about boundaries and standing up for the self, but now I have flashbacks of a lifetime of people treating me as a doormat, and I'm so frustrated and sad about the fact that I did not have the knowledge, language, words, courage, guts to stand up for me. Um, I just froze uh, most of the time. Can you advise me on when this comes up, how to handle it? Um, I get so angry in the present and sometimes now I shout back to the past. Yeah, well, I get that. Um, John, thoughts? Um, you know, the phrase that comes up for me is find the baby there. Um, the kid who was a doormat, what do they need to hear from you? I think it's a very adult reaction to get mad. Um, the kid that you were may have been angry, but my guess is, you know, mo most little kids, they don't get angry or they don't show anger in those kind of situations because anger is an entitlement emotion, meaning when we feel it, we claim it. And if we're really going to feel it, nobody can shut us down. Um, little kids don't always have that option. A lot of times there's people around tamping down their anger, tamping out, down their outbursts, um, that little kid may be more in touch with the sadness and the pain. And um, I would start there. What, what does that little kid need to hear when they experience being a doormat? Because um, the anger there can be really recursive. You can find, I can get angry, but it's not moving anything along. It's probably because there's some grief and sadness underneath the anger um, that would be really important to get to. And I think it's also important to mention that as kids, you know, we're often not allowed to stand up for ourselves. At least yeah. in my house, I was not allowed to, I was allowed to smile and make good grades and be good at sports. That's what I was allowed to do. Uh, and to be really pleasant and, and say please and thank you. Um, I was not allowed to have any emotions of my own or to question anything or to go against the grain. I just wasn't allowed. And that was, as I grew older, you know, how does someone transition? I know how I did it, which was badly, but how does someone transition from not being allowed to have a self to actually having a self and exercising that self? I, I went through 25 years of addiction before I- You know, I, I even think addiction is an attempt at this. Um, like you said, it's, it's done badly, but it's an attempt to explore- Without question, by the way, without question. You're, you're 100% yeah. right. It's, it's an attempt to get to know yourself and, and to figure out who you really are and what you like and what you don't like. Um, many addicts that I work with, they go the route of addiction because in the light of day, there's not room or permission to do that. And it really, like for, for a kid, for a teenager, it really, there really needs to be permission. They're gonna do it whether or not you want them to. But to say, I understand this is your process. You've got to go through this. You and I are not the same person. Um, I, I really hope we can stay close as you get to the other end. Let's see what happens. Like that's, that's a secure container for a kid to develop in. Um, and in adulthood, we have to provide that uh, for ourselves as well. Um, I may be angry with my mother and right now I may be, you know, holding a firm boundary. That's self-discovery. There may be a part of me that really, really wants to come out on the end of being connected, but I don't know what's going to happen. Let's see. Um, it, it's, it's again, affording yourself that opportunity. Um, the, the, the only way you develop a sense of, of self is to try things out and reference yourself. How do I think about this? What do I feel about this? Not, is this right or wrong? Or does, you know, does mother approve or does church approve or whatever that is? It's reference yourself first. That's how you get that, that voice inside of you. 
and does trauma work help? Do, do things like EMDR and and do those things help? And and how do they work? And why? Yeah, I I love how when I was when I was uh, becoming a when I was getting my EMDR training, I love how they described it. Um, they they said when you break a bone and you go to the doctor's office, does the doctor heal your broken bone? And you know the room is nodding and the presenter does this, so everybody starts doing this and they don't know why. And the presenter says, uh, "Your body will heal itself. The doctor's job is to remove the impediments to healing happening. So if the bone is not set correctly, the doctor will set the bone, but the doctor doesn't stimulate the bone growth." Um, if you need a cast to immobilize so that your, your arm can, you know, uh, be, uh, be set up, uh, to heal correctly. Um, the doctor does that, but your body does the healing. Um, so when it comes to trauma and, and these kind of issues, what trauma treatment is, is doing is removing the impediments to you growing naturally, um, the way you would, what, what I've seen, uh, by and large is once the impediments are removed, a lot of natural good growth happens. Occasionally you'll run into stuff where I really don't know how to do this. Or I don't know what this is and I need someone to teach me. And then again, once you learn and the impediment is removed or that impediment is guilt or fear or whatever, um, when you know better, you do better. Um, when you can do better, you do better. Um, so uh, tra trauma treatment is I think really important with this because there's a lot of messages and there's a lot of sensations that hold us back a lot of rules from the past that we follow, those live deep, deep, deep in our DNA. And trauma treatment helps to extract and separate um, from those, those rules that, that are now impediments. Um, thank you. This next one, I think we covered a little bit, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it out anyway. Is it possible for a sex addict to be enmeshed with a mother who was neglectful as opposed to in, inappropriately smothering? Um, my husband has a lot of anger that showed up and is acting out. Yeah, I'd say that that's uh, without, you know, interviewing your husband and getting to know the ins and outs of that, which, you know, I would say is a good idea to, to find out what's, uh, what exactly is going on. Um, anger can be intoxicating and anger can obsess us. And, and again, I, I work with a lot of guys who hear the enmeshment stuff and say, I think that's what's going on for me, but it's really more driven by the anger and uh, the desire for vengeance than it is the, um, I feel like I need to take care of this person. Um, sometimes underneath the anger and, and vengeance is this deep sense of duty, um, but that, that has to be sorted out uh, first. Uh, someone who's, there's a lot of reasons why you can get obsessed with your mother. Enmeshment is one, rage is another. Yeah, the, the enmeshment part is usually a child feels special or, I mean, the child is basically turned into the partner. I mean, my father was, he worked a lot and he, he, he drank and was emotionally not present. So, you know, and he wouldn't go to movies with my mother and he wouldn't, you know, so I was her movie date and she would tell me I was her, the handsomest date there. And, you know, I got dragged to, you know, when I was eight years old to, you know, R rated movies because my, you know, things like that. It was, it was an inappropriate relationship. Um, and I was there to meet the needs of my mother rather than vice versa. Um, but I, I got lots of attention. Uh, sometimes I felt special, um, but it was too close. Um, that to me is enmeshment. And then, and then if there's a sexualized element where, you know, mom walks in on you when you're in the bathroom or whatever, then it becomes what I call covert incest. And I don't know if John has different, different definitions of that. But. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, you can have a too close element with a, a parent who is overall uh, too distant and too neglectful. There can still be that too close, but I would say the too close element is necessary for it to really be enmeshment. Um, otherwise we're, we're dealing with the grief and the rage and the anger that comes from abuse, which again can be all consuming um, and it can look very similar, but the, the etiology is different. A lot of the angry guys that I work with, they won't, uh, they don't identify with the ambivalence part. They don't identify with the guilt part. They're just angry and they have a right to be. Um, it's just that the enmeshment track is not the clearest track for them. Um, okay, let's go to the next one here. Um, I think the way a child is treated by caregivers becomes a uh, tablet for relations. I think we're, um, tablet's not the right one. I can't come up with the right word either. Um, Template. <laughs> Thank you, template for, for relations, but also the connection with your higher power. Am I right? 
um, because I really need a higher power, but I feel so angry towards him um, and the push-pull treatment. Um, this is from, this is a follow-up from the person who, who was just learning as an adult about um, the abuse. Um, I think that's an excellent question. Yeah, they, they say the first God of your understanding is your parents. Um, so I, I definitely think it's all wrapped up. Um, you know, to, to, to give a little personal insight, when I was early to recovery, um, I had a sponsor who told me to write a help wanted ad for God. And the biggest criteria is uh, you have to be okay with me being angry with you. Um, I grew up in a home where anger wasn't okay. I grew up in a, a faith tradition where anger was a sin. Um, and, uh, the way I worked it out in my mind, you know, I had this help wanted ad out there and then I had to figure out like, okay, well, how would that actually work with God? Cause I've always understood it this way. And, you know, I thought the God that I believe in has, um, witnessed terrible, terrible things in the world. He's witnessed people murdering, um, other people. He's witnessed hunger and famine and all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, this is, I, I come from a, a Judeo Christian background. Uh, this is the you know, the, the God in the Old Testament who would, you know, smite people and, and nations. Um, and I said, if, if, if this is part of that God's makeup, he can certainly handle me being angry with him one-on-one. -on -one. Um, otherwise, if, if my anger is too big for the God of the universe, I don't know that I have a powerful enough God. Um, so I think that ability uh, to be angry toward and express that to a parent, to a higher power, whether that's the parent in your head or the higher power in your head or whatever that looks like. Anger is a natural part of who we are. It's not a defect. Um, it's, not a, it's not an aberration. It's one of our basic emotions. And um, it's important to set up places in your life that um, can hold that and um, that it's, it's okay to be angry in. And I would say definitely, uh, if, if you're a recovering person and um, you're angry, uh, you need to have a higher power who can hold that and, and is not going to run away from your anger. Um, it looks like we lost Scott. Uh, I think it's still recording and I think people can still see me. Um, someone could just put in the chat if uh, I'm still visible and if it's just Scott that dropped off. All right, there we go. Uh, I'll, I'll look at the next question. Um, it says, when my enmeshed husband's therapist tells him they will not address the enmeshment for a year, please tell me how my situation as the wife can improve when it comes to him reacting to the wrong woman. Um, I don't know what your husband's therapist is seeing. Um, and uh, that might be something if, if you're in contact, uh, it, it might be important to find out. Um, I don't know why that recommendation would be made. Um, I could certainly see some cases with people that I work with. Um, I, I could see that, uh, being the case, um, but you, you would have to ask that that treatment provider themselves what the reasoning is behind that. So like I said, there could be some some uh, good reasons. Um, I think some of this comes back to boundaries as well. Sometimes the road to recovery and healing for the individual isn't a great road for their partner to be on. And um, you know this is where uh, some some separation, some distancing can be useful. I'm willing to I'm willing to wait around and I'm willing to be here on the other side. Uh, but if you're not able to get to this and you keep doing this to me, um, I'm not going to stay in your crosshairs. Um, but yeah, I would I would see if you can talk to the treatment provider and find out why that why that's the case. Hi, I'm back. I zapped out there for a minute. Um, it looks like you you took that last question there. Yep. Okay. Um, I did have a question, um, and this is a little off our topic, but in terms of recovery for addicts and also for betrayed partners, um, like 12-step meetings, they, 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 they talk about not necessarily being religious programs, because they're not, but they're spiritual programs. Um, how important do you think a higher power is, and why or why not, um, as part of someone's recovery? Oh, really good question. Um, according to the research, it doesn't really matter. Um, according to the research, uh, essentially all roads lead to Rome and it's more about finding something that, that speaks to you. I think uh, a lot of people grow up with a sense that there is something bigger than them out there, um, that they are part of something bigger. A lot of people grow up religiously. And um, I, I think when you grow up religiously in, in a way it's in your DNA. 
And um, like so much else in recovery, and I talked about this a little earlier today, recovery is about recrafting your experience and your world to work for you. Um, that's something you were trying to do in addiction, but you weren't doing it very directly and therefore not very effectively. You were trying to recraft your world in secret. Um, I think recovery is about coming out in the light of day and saying, this is what I need. And this is, I know myself and this is what's going to work for me. Um, so if, if the concept of a higher power is in your DNA or you feel a part of you pulled to that, I think it's essential that you grapple with that. I think it's essential you confront it. Um, you, you can't make parts of you go away or quiet them because they're inconvenient to deal with. Um, you know, so I, I guess that that's where my mind goes with that question right now, Scott, is a higher power can be a part of us and we have to, we have to deal with it. And, and again, in, in recovery, if you're crafting your own world, why wouldn't you craft a higher power that will work better for you than the one that you thought you had? Yeah. And I liked what you said earlier about, you know, our first higher power is our parents. Um, and, and they, they provide, our, our initial higher power provides a template for our relationships, which I, I kind of agree. And um, you know, for me, I actually found the concept of a higher power to be kind of an impediment in early recovery because I didn't have a very nice higher version of a higher power. You know, it was oh, yeah. the white guy with the long beard and the robes and the Birkenstocks and, you know, raining plagues <laughs> down upon us and taking, you know, the third born shot and, you know, doing all that yeah. stuff and, you know, very inconsistent, but also supposed to be really loving and, you know, feed the masses. And, and that was kind of, it mirrored my parents who were, yeah. you know, at times very loving and at times not. Um, and, and I really struggled with, I needed something consistent early in recovery. Um, and I had to let go of the higher power that I had and do the same exercise you did along with about a hundred others, trying yeah. to find a higher power that would work for me. Um, you know, that was loving and consistent and, you know, um, had a sense of humor and <laughs> was not judgmental and not punishing and, you know, was more guiding than controlling and, and things like that. Um, you know, not abusive, you know, yeah. emotionally abusive, not intimidating. You know, I mean, we hit it, intimidating and emotionally abusive today. That was my higher power that I grew up with was intimidating and emotionally abusive. You know, with, with higher powers mirroring parents and another realization I had to come to about the higher power I'd been raised with, I'd been raised to believe in a fragile narcissist as a God. And, um, you know, once I found out where that came from, again, there's a contradiction. It's like, I don't know how this works. The being that keeps the universe in, in order is a fragile narcissist. That doesn't, that doesn't work. So I had to drop one or the other, either there's a fragile narcissist that I'm, I'm supposed to believe in, or, um, I've got the nature of my higher power wrong. Um, and that's something that I'll, I'll often uh, run into. I'm still in the faith tradition that I was raised in. And there's times where, you know, I'll be in the congregation and I'll hear somebody talk and I'll be like, oh, you, you still think that God's a fragile narcissist. I remember what it was like <laughs> there. Um, you know, th thankfully, I, again, I grappled with that part of myself, um, that part of the universe uh, that I live in. And figured some things out rather than continuing to take what was shoveled out to me and not ever figuring out, you know, how, how, is there a reconciliation that can happen here or is, is this really how it is? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I'm glad you were able to reckon, reconcile and, and find the good in, in the faith in which you were raised. Um, you know, I, I haven't, um, and I'm okay with that, but what I will say is, you know, some of the best, people like genuinely best people on earth that I've ever met are devout Christians and some of the worst people on earth right. that I've ever met are also devout Christians and, I, and yeah. I was like oh my goodness so I guess we we get what we get what get from it what we bring to it maybe I don't know yeah I, you know I uh what was it that I was hearing this morning um oh I don't remember what I was listening to but th they talked something about uh you know, this, oh, um, test, was, that's what it was. It was a Stan Tatkin training I was in. He was saying high levels of testosterone can make a person aggressive if they're already predisposed to be aggressive. Right. Um, and I think there's a lot, uh, our, our belief in and the God that we accept, I think tells us a lot about what our predispositions are. Yeah. 
Um, you know, if you are shame based and need justice in the universe at all times, you're probably going to reflect a higher power that's more like that. Um, if that's, you know, part of your makeup that you must have. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, we got a couple of minutes left, but we're out of questions. And um, there, there was one more I'm seeing here. We might have time to get to it. Uh, the anonymous question right above the last one. Oh, that probably came in when I wasn't here. Go ahead, it's, which means I can't see it, but go ahead. Okay. It says, so in your distinction between enmeshment uh, versus rage at abusive parent, if the child ends up as an adult denying any problems in childhood and idealizing his parents and the rage is completely unacknowledged, does that make it more likely a case of enmeshment? Uh, I would say not necessarily. Um, keep, keep in mind, I, I'd say that's more an issue of maturity. Um, Kids need to belong to the best. That's why you know you went to the best school, you had the best family, at least for a long time in your life. That's how you saw it because you needed to. Um, when somebody uh, who has an adult's body but can't step outside of their family system and um, assess it objectively, I'd say that's more of a maturity issue first. Um, they may not feel like they're an adult who can stand on their own two feet. What if I did come from a family that was abusive? What if my parents didn't really love each other? Um, and uh, what, what if my house was stressful? Um, that has implications for self-image. Um, and so, so I'd, I'd say, you know, but before you can decide whether or not that's enmeshment or not, I think you look at how, how capable is this person of holding reality for what it is, or do they feel themselves so connected to what the reality is, they have to bend it in order to feel like they, you know, can exist okay. Okay, I saw something just pop in again. Um, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> so, okay, we'll cut it off now. John, I will see you in two weeks. Um, great topic. Um, hope you do more of this. And uh, thank you everybody for being here and for your great questions today. Excellent. Thanks everybody.